It's that most wonderful time of the year. Well, gentlemen, here we are. This is part two of the end of your video. This is the 96 pill that um, everybody's really interested to watch me rebuild. There is so much work that's going to go on with this particular amp. And I have wanted to come out here and start on this now for five days, six days. And I have had um, some pretty major back issues take place here in the last couple days. And I've had um, the ability to stand because of my foot has freaking been giving me some shit. But I think I've overcome most of that and I just got to do this in stages. So I think it is time to start. Uh, did they actually, they did, they actually used screws. Wow. All right, well, so start, step one here is gonna be busting this, this mess apart. Let's see, is there one down here? Yeah, there's one down here too. I'm actually gonna have to flip this around here in a minute. But this is where I ended up setting it for now. So, we are gonna try and reuse the blowers. That is a, a thing. So, let's take this piece of plastic off the top here and uh, this ain't nothing but a piece of like Lexan plexiglass or something so that doesn't work out too well and I swear the reason they did this the reason I'm taking this off in this manner is I want to show you guys something let me set these blowers out of the way over here I'm not gonna trip on them every day for the next week. Is this here? I have a feeling we're gonna we're gonna do a surgical autopsy on this this combiner here in a minute. But I have a feeling, a theory, an idea, um, a premise, a possibility that the reason that this kept burning up was because it was so close to the lid. Um, so anytime you have active RF and then you take a plate and you put it over or in proximity to RF, it acts as a capacitor, right? There's no difference between this motion of the ocean, putting a metal plate next to this, as there is with these vacuum variables, which is a series of rings that go in inside each other, okay? The proximity of ground is so elevated that I have a feeling that this was arcing to the lid, which we're gonna address that too. But it is time, it is time for me to start. So we're gonna start stripping this thing apart. So if you're just now joining us, like you're just now tuning in, I would strongly suggest that you watch uh, part one of this series. As you'll see in the title, this is part two. Uh, part one in the series, we talk about why we're doing this, how we're going to go about doing this. I got to build a power supply to run this thing. This is a 96 pill. We're just going to, let me give you a quick recover of where we're at. This is a 96 pill that everybody and their brother's been in and repaired it and had their fingers inside of it. Um, the whole front section of this amp, this area up here from this half has been worked on by um, Foxy and a few other people. But this back portion, this clusterized mess um, has been gone over by many other people too. There's so much wrong here, I don't even know where to start really. So in my head, when I'm thinking to myself how I'm gonna handle this, is we got to break it apart in stages, right? So the first step for this 
and this is going to be a complete rebuild on this box. We are not reusing this cabinet. We are going to construct him a new cabinet. Um, I mean, it's got some blown 10 ohmers throughout. There's quite a few 10 ohm smokes that have been let gone here. And um, I mean, literally, I got to pull every transistor out of this amp. We're going to replace it with different parts. Uh, power wires are all going to change. The combiners are all going to change. We are completely rebuilding this because I told the guy that owns this box no when I first saw it. I said, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. He wanted me to originally fix this in his garage, and I said, no, that's definitely not happening, right? I said, if you want me to work on this, you can drive this up to me and drop it off, because this cabinet is so flimsy, there's no way we could ship it. It'd just get mangled. But there's so much bad here that I can't, just, there's just no way, right? There's just, there's just no way. So, here it actually made it here, and I'm like, well, let's give it a whack. So, we built a power supply so I can run this. So, I have the ability to power this now. My workbench is now up to 3,900 amps at 15 volts. So, the idea now is that we've got to figure out how to um, actually make this work. And it's going to be a lot easier for me to visualize what's going to happen once we get all the parts pulled off all the bad parts. There's a lot of scab work in here. Um, there's a lot of, well, this failed, so let's just do them. There's a lot of the just, let's just do the absolute minimum that we have to do to get this running. And um, <clears throat> very unorganized. I mean, if it ever did work, he claims he saw it work when he first bought it, but it didn't last for very long. There's a reason why, you know. Uh, the other main reason that we got to put another cabinet on it is that there is less than a pen's width worth of opening here in the front of the cabinet for our air to flow through. And the other problem is we have the same amount of opening at the back of the cabinet down there. So that big blower is sitting here blowing air down. None of it's going this direction. It's all going out through the back of the cabinet. And then the back of the cabinet has got a whole bunch of little holes in the back of it. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of restrictions. So, needless to say, you reach a point where you just got to say, okay, enough. There's a lot of mismatched caps. There's a lot of, there's just a lot. Enough. Let's just go ahead and take this all apart and let's start over. So, what we're going to do now is the, the first thing I want to do is I want to make this thing a little bit more manageable for me to move around. And that's going to involve us removing all of the power wires. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to pull the combiners out. So let me uh, let me start here. I've been wanting to do this now for a week. Let's just start here. Ah. Come over here and we'll. This is a boarded little piece of junk. They passed, this thing is going to need 2,500 amps worth of schmoo. And they had it going through these two connectors on the positive side. There's 600 amps worth of capability here. So that means we left 1,900 amps worth of resistor heat. Gonna throw that on the floor. Let's see here. Let's uh, let's do this too while we're here. I think the wires could have handled it. The problem is the connectors are well, they're for shit. We'll take this. 300 amp connector off. Throw it on the floor too. Now if you let your eyeballs relax and you look at this from a, the sky down point of view, the 6,000 foot in down point of view, you'll see that we have a hot lead here, which is one aught. You know that because of the writing on it. This is one aught cable. This is also one aught cable. 
the only ground on the inside of this box is this single piece of one odd. Now to help compensate for this single ground, there's this strap that then there's insulator material here. I, man, I can't wait to see what's underneath this. There's this strap. They've got it on both sides. This, this, and this is all copper. This copper ground strap that they have soldered in multiple places on the board. Um, they've got drywall screws holding it in, sheet metal screws left and right. Then we flip over to a different one. Then here's an extra ground lead that comes up through this edge of the cabinet. Yeah, there's no way I'm fixing this in his garage. There's just no way. I'm standing there and I'm looking at this guy that owns this box and he's like, come on, you can, I got, I got, I got, I got a, he had a single battery and like a hundred amp battery charger that was on an egg timer. I was like, just no. Uh -uh. So, um, today's goal is to get this stripped down and get the tuners out of this thing. We're going to pull the relays out, get the line section off. Um, get the get this combiner out. I want to autopsy this combiner. I want to see what's going on on the inside of this thing. Uh, get this connection all taken apart, and get this connector. This is how this works. All the output RF comes to this combiner. Then it goes to this connection, and it runs up this 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 conductor, which is completely random length. Then the tuner goes to ground through another piece. This is 218 coax, by the way. Another piece right here, and then it attaches here. So this is our inductor, and this is our capacitor. Um, that's just electrically wrong. But this is the way the guys used to do it. This, this is the way it was done, old school OG back in the day. Um, Let's look at here. Here's our positive leads. We'll use this for an example. This is six gauge um, ground wire. Somebody soldered an eyelet onto it and then somehow created a connection here. But then this is our 12 volt lead going down also. And it holds the wire up and supports it. We're going to do something different but similar in this setup. But I need to, I need to take it all apart. I really want to take this all apart and see what we got for the guts of this thing and then make adjustments as we go from there. Let me get this power wire out and uh, let's get this ground lead out of here and we'll get this other power wire out and we'll come back. So give me just a minute. So we're joined with Santa's little helper. Say hi Santa's little helper. Hi guys. I got my wife out here. She's going to help me move this. So here's the problem that we're having is this is not one homogenous piece of metal, this is four pieces of metal. And when I mean metal is I mean like the heat sink. There's this section, this section, so it's four separate boards, pallets, heat sinks that are all strapped together. This is held together with the dreams of small children in third world countries and, um, well, Santa's little helpers. There's magical little RF pixie elves that are holding this together. That's right. That's it. <laughs> Literally, some of the, they've got solder joints that have just been like cobble tacked in here. Got another one here, a couple others here, another one here, another one here, another one there. If we pick this thing up in the middle, my, my dear, like if I try to see this, the whole thing is this, this is flexing in the middle. So Santa's little helpers out here because we got to get rid of this cabinet and all the weight of this thing is resting on the cabinet. Now I'm debating if I want, when we get this apart or out of this cabinet, if I should just go ahead and break it up into its four separate sections and do the repairs independently on each section, just because this is going to break. It just depends on how many wires are connecting the section right. to the one next to it. But for us to go any further, this has got to come out of there. So if we go and we lift up on just like the corners, it's going to fold up like an accordion in the middle. I'm sharing this all with you guys so you know what I'm up against here. 
to help it not fold this direction, um, that whoever built this originally put this piece of plumber's gack and other plumber gack, and they've got little washers and eyelets and garbage, basically, um, holding it together. I've left this mounting rib, this mounting rib in place to help support this joint. I got the same thing going on over here, but still this is gonna be an incredibly delicate lift. Now, no, you guys do not get to watch this on video because <laughs> inevitably shit's gonna happen. It's gonna be a mess. It's gonna be a mess, hot mess. <laughs> but when we go to put it back together, it's not gonna be a hot mess that way. So I propose what we do is we take and we set this down on the floor and then we lift from somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. and then lift it up onto the workbench. We can try that. Um, the other option is that maybe we slide something underneath. take the new base plate for the, uh -huh. and we slide this underneath it, and then we lift up from that base plate. I like that better. Yeah. But we'll see how this goes. Yeah. The, the goal is to get this up here and not completely F it off. You know, um, I did get up this morning, and I went to the store to buy Reese's peanut butter cups. And then the next thing you know, I'm looking at beer, and then I came to the conclusion that I like titties and left. So the moral of the story totally is, don't buy Reese's peanut butter cups, don't drink too much beer and like boobs. And on that note, we'll be back after we get this lifted onto the bench, bye. <laughs> the hardware that I left in this bracket, it all broke off <laughs> as soon as we tried to, we ended up sitting it on the floor. Um, this is gonna be the new bottom pan for the amplifier. Um, the other one was made of sheet metal, aluminum style of sheet metal. I'm going to show you the back of the cabinet here in a minute. Uh, all the joking aside, I knew that this was going to be the problem from day one. So I went ahead and I bought myself um, a large stick of angle aluminum. And it is exactly the same width and height as the under edged lip of the heat sink, right? this here, this space here. So what I'm gonna do is I'll take this large stick, I'm gonna cut two runners that are probably gonna be about this long. Um, I'm gonna cut two runners in it so that we can, we'll probably pop ribbit it so the bottom of the cabinet can say smooth and then we'll bolt into the heat sink on both sides. So the way this was configured before was this straight from don't know where um, galvanized piece of steel. Where that's kind of how it was supported. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this angle iron, we're gonna bolt directly to the heat sink fin down both sides, and then we're gonna ribbit and bolt down on um, the angle to this base plate. So for the first time in this amplifier's life, it's gonna have one homogeneous piece of metal holding everything this way and holding everything this way down both sides. Now, the idea is, is that we're gonna take the same piece of angle aluminum, same thickness, and for the side plates, we're gonna add yet a second runner. So that's gonna work out and then we'll bolt the side plates to the, the angle aluminum. So it's gonna be double rigid, we're gonna put basically build a half box, right? A little half of a square tube on both sides. I gotta square this up on this plate. Um, right now we got this sitting on a Lazy Susan and then I've got Teflon blocks sitting here supporting the outside edge. But when I take the Teflon blocks out, we can see how much this thing sags. So, yes, my dear. I'm gonna run to the store and then I'm gonna go pick up our dinner and then I'll be back home. Okay. Are you good with this? I'm totally good for right now. Okay. Thanks, babe. See you in a bit. Yep, love you. Love you. Somewhere in the middle, I'm thinking out here, I'm gonna add a copper reinforcement square. We'll drill a hole through the middle of the four corners of the heat sink. We're gonna put a bolt in the middle and then have a solid, first time in its life, a solid common ground point in the middle of the cabinet. Um, we'll probably do the same thing down here on this end. Remember, we, I cut this aluminum specifically for this project so that it was long, way long. If you can remember, we had the width of a pen 
down here. For all the air that was traveling down the entire amplifier, we had the width of a pen here in the front for the air to turn and then head back in the op 100, you know, 180 degrees in the opposite direction. We're going to do the same thing down here. We're going to set the ass end of the cabinet. So we're going to provide as much room as we can up here to allow the air to collimate and flip directions. But then down here on this end, once again, after we get our distance established from the back wall, so I'll slide the heat sink up till it's touching this piece of angle aluminum once we get it squared. And then I'm going to have two little tabs, one that sits down here, one that sits down here, that the back plate's going to screw onto, but then we're going to leave the whole back of this open so the air can exhaust with the least amount of air restriction that we can get. I'll take phenolic board and craft a box that hangs off the back of this and seals against the edge of the cabinet. We're even going to get really high tech and we're going to use this metal reinforced gasket material between the phenolic and the edge of the cabinet to create a seal. Novel, right? So we're going to force we're going to force it so that the air has to go through the heat sink, travel down the length of the heat sink and come out the back. Now, if a guy really 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 was smart about things, he would take and flip this over. He'd break this up into its four sections, he'd flip it over, then have another bracket system, have these other four sec or these other two sections stacked upon it so the heat sinks would be facing each other. We'd pressurize the air through the middle. Then we could take like two 120 millimeter fans and put them one on the top, one on the bottom, have the thing sit on its side and be able to cool the components on the top with the fans but have the blower actually doing useful work. I'm trying to make the best of a really bad design and trying to make the best of a bad situation. What we discovered, and I say we, very tongue in cheek, what the builders discovered before me, before I was born, discovered, and no, Dave did not do this first. People were building amplifiers long before Dave came along. But what they figured out was is the amount of cold air you dump in down there, by the time it gets back here to the back of the cabinet, it's already picked up or absorbed as much heat energy as that it could be transferred to the air by the time we got back here. This end of the cabinet will always run notoriously hotter than the front end of the cabinet, just because of heat saturation, right? So cold air go in, incredibly hot air come out because now all the energy that is being transferred to the air is, st is slowly accumulating before it can exhaust out of the cabinet. In this particular situation, the previous builders before me, how they decided to offset that is they, they put the blower right here. Now, in the south and in the east, where there's this thing called humidity, right? That means there's been a lot of moist, I know that offends some people, moist, moist air has been pressed down on the board and has sat here. That's the reason that the board is discolored and it was all heavily corroded right through this area. But then we get up to the front, it's relatively clean. Got it? Now, to add insult to injury, they made the cabinet literally that much bigger than the, the, the heat sink. So we have now grown out about an inch and a half on each side and almost a full two inches on each end, which gives us room to work. Now we're going to capitalize on that as well. There's going to be some other trick shit done with the power wire that, well not power wire, probably solid copper bus that's going to go down through here and help us carry more ground current to each pallet, each heat sink. Believe me when I tell you, if there is enough screws in the phenolic up here bolting to the heat sink underneath, the metal mass of the heat sink will carry way more current than any wire from all aspects. Surface area, current flow, heat saturation. You start to run into an X-max of, well, how much current can I really shove through this wire? Well, 
The more we can shorten the distances on things here, the better things are going to run. The shorter the power wire, the shorter the ground, all of those distances. So like in an ideal world, we'd have a couple bolts that hung on the back of the cabinet and that's where all the ground current would flow from. Because remember, the electrons flow from ground to hot, right? Flow in a big circle. These little tiny brackets weren't enough. Hence the reason why they were having such a hard time. Like, you'll see that there's been a ground wire added here. I guess this is a positive wire, but then we don't have it over here. Then we've added this little ground wire here. Well, then we've added a little solder splob here and another little ground wire here, but then we have nothing up here. Oh, we got more solder splatter. And it goes on up through the cabinet. Hence the reason why they had to have ground strap here and ground strap there and ground strap over here and ground strap over here. They didn't have enough ground universally surrounding this thing to carry enough current to the amplifier. So they've tried to compensate for it. I've got so much work. I've got to go through and there's like just random little wires floating around. Oh, we need a little bit more ground over here or on the output side, they weren't getting a good ground going up to the vacuum variable. So they decided this was a solution. It's the same thing this was used for. How is that going to carry enough current? The tin that the cabinet is made up of is so thin that it couldn't carry enough current. And the attachment points for the hardware and for the heatsink was so thin that it could not carry enough current. So that's why we have to start compensating for it with stuff like this. There wasn't enough homogeneous or universal or common ground point to now where we're adding ground straps that hang outside of the cabinet to attempt to achieve that. I looked at this and I went, what a effing mess. It's just bad cobbled on top of bad, top, cobbled on top of bad. So half or more of the problem with this box was the cabinet and the way it was mounted together and the way the electrical was distributed inside the cabinet. I saw that right off the hob. Another third of the problem is this has got 2879Cs in it and an amplifier that was designed to run 2879s, Toshiba's. The two parts, which we have universally accepted, everybody has come to understand, everybody knows, everybody gets it. It is a, it is a fact that the 2879C does not work in the circuit, these parts that surround a 2879 Toshiba. You cannot swap the two. You have to change the number of turns in the output transformer. The number of turns the input transformer. You have to change the capacitance on the input and output transformers. You have to change the capacitance on the input and output of each one of the four pill sections. It has to happen. Because remember, I was just talking with one of my students about this tonight, Chris, 394 Audible Technologies. You cannot, your goal as a builder is to maximize the circuit around the part. You cannot change the circuit to try and manipulate how the part runs. Let that sink in. I hear guys say this all the time. Well, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> I can get this transistor to do blah, 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 and jerk my cock. Okay, um, all they're saying when people are braggadocious like that, they have sat down and they figured out how to modify the circuit to where it's a little bit more in tune with the transistor. You cannot manipulate the circuit to make the part do more. The part's going to do the same no matter what you do to it. But what you can do is manipulate the circuit to be more efficient around the part. Now mathematically we can run into a wall, the efficiency of the component. All these transistors are about 60-68% on a good day with a soft breath of a young pointy titted woman blowing upon the part, you'll get 68% efficiency somewhere in there out of the part. So the only place that we can make an, a depreciable difference in gain, and not really gain, but a depreciable difference in how efficient the circuit is, is how efficient the parts are around it. How closely configured can we get the components tuned to the component, to the transistor? So when you start seeing shit like this, that tells me that the the outlying components 
if there's not enough board capture where you got screws going through to the aluminum metal mass that's then in turn carrying the ground current to the top side for the transistors. There should be, in theory, in between each one of these output transformers, there should be a screw that goes to the heatsink. And that one little screw over that tiny little distance can carry a shit bucket worth of amps. Well, in this particular design, we have screws on the outside corners. We have one here. We have another set, usually somewhere in here, and then we'll have another set on the outside ends. There's not enough surface tension, enough metal mass between the heat sink and the board to carry enough current to each one of these transistors. So let's see, we got two, four, six, eight. Right here is 200 amps. There's another 200 amps. Here's another 200 amps. There's another 200 amps. There's another 200 amps. Another 200 amps. Okay. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. There's 1,200 amps worth of draw on just this half of the board. 2,400 total, roughly. This way we built a 2,500 amp power supply. And we've got 20 or 1400 amps worth of current going through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight screws. Well, that's eight screws that look like this. Eight rusted, effed off screws. These are galvanized screws going to copper, going to aluminum. And then underneath that, the screw is probably made of steel. So we have a high RF environment with a high current load and a heavy electromechanical field. There's a lot of electrical field current going between the screw heads that are galvanized, trying to conduct current to copper, trying to conduct current to aluminum through a steel substrate with a galvanized coating. Ground straps. That's why they had to add ground straps. I bet you when they added this ground strap and that one and this one over here and that one, all of a sudden the box took off like a rocket ship. I can almost bet money. I mean, I wasn't there when it happened, but I can tell you just by looking at this, just physically looking at this with my set of eyes. To back that story up even further, let's take a look at this section of the amplifier. First off, we can tell they're having a hard time with the 12 volt positive side. Look at how many times this has been hit with a soldering iron in its life. Scary, right? They have going from one of the board screws, this big piece of four gauge, and not even three inches away, four inches away, they have that same eyelet now soldered permanently to the board. They were having a ground issue on this side of the cabinet, dollar for donut. And their solution was, instead of taking this and running it over here where it might do some good, they brought it right down to the board and soldered it. The other problem that we've got going on is I don't know if you guys, your eyes have relaxed enough to catch all of this. Right through here is a seam. It's the same seam as right here. No, there is no seam here. Right through here is a seam. It runs right through the middle of this whole mess right down the middle. And that's what they're trying to compensate for. There's two screws to provide 200 amps worth of current load here. So this screw here and this screw out here is all that, no, there's a screw out here, is all that attaches this piece of phenolic to the heatsink. And the more you look, you'll see that it's missing screws all over the place, like right here. Look at this. And then on top of that, our toroids are flopping around. Look at this. If this toroid makes contact with this portion of the conductor, it now energizes this toroid with the RF. And the last time I checked, that's no good. 
this piece of ferrite has to float insulated above this connection. Everywhere I look, there's shit like this. Everywhere. Now we come down here. Let's take a look at what's happening down here. Um, I have a friend. It is a female. She works on amplifiers. She has been there, done that, got the t-shirt, and the whole nine yards. She openly admits, this is somebody else, this is her. She knows about this toroid issue. How do we know that she knows about the toroid issue? Let's look at how her toroids are attached. Same thing here. There's these big long leads on the, on the toroid mounts. These black toroids here are her work. Look at this. See this? There's no way this ferrite bead can bounce and make contact. Either it be with the common sum together point or the output sides. All of this is her. You see how they're all floating away? So now, let's step back and start counting things. Like, I'm going over this the same way you guys are going over this. One, two, three, four, five wraps. Okay. One, two, three, four wraps. One, two, three, four, five wraps. One, two, three, four, five wraps. Once again, another whole builder. Now that we're down here, look at this different colored wire again. One, two, three, four, five wraps. All right, let's go look at this over here. We got five here. We got one. One, two, three, four, five. All right. Some of these are going to need some serious rework. Some are not. Um, there was one or two of these when I counted them earlier, the wrap turns. The reason I'm making a big deal out of this is there is one or two of them that don't have the right turn ratio in them. Um, another problem that I saw is this here. This whole section here is burned down this whole section here and there's a bunch of burned up parts over here in this section as well. Well we come back and we look at the pre-combiner because this is your second to your final so you've got your outputs they all get summed together this is a combiner for this section this is the combiner for that section this section is fried and I mean fried the wire that is inside of these ferrite beads is not only burnt but it is cut this one here has got a, a break in it, and it has a break in it right where it makes a, a turn right past this toroid. I mean, burnt. Like, this has gotten hot. I initially thought that somebody had desoldered this. No, sir. What has happened here is this entire mess has gotten so hot that it unsoldered itself. So, out of the 96 transistors that are going on, a full over a full third of it desoldered. I guess it'd be a fourth. Yeah, it'd be a fourth. This has got a big problem going on in here. There's a couple blown 10 ohm resistors in this section. It's got a lot of work. I got it out of the cabinet today. It's great. I got all the power wires pulled out of it, which were a joke. This is a joke, by the way. 2,400 amps worth of current this box pulls. We haven't even gotten to the good part yet. This is the crispy goodness. And it's coming soon. I can't wait to pull this apart. But from the outside looking in, what I have to do now is I have to stabilize the cabinet. I have to stabilize the boards. I'm a little afraid to take it any farther afield apart than this right now. I need this, this, this screw that's right here, this, this piece of hardware that's right here, is welded in place. At some point or another, enough current has passed through this connector to where I cannot get it to come undone. So I'm probably going to have to take and dremel this off, clean that up, make it look pretty. I need to come back and get rid of all these braid wires and unsolder all this garbage, unsolder all of that garbage, right? 
clean all this up. I have to create my support ribs. I've got to bolt all of this together. I've got to get the heat sink squared up. And I've got to stabilize these pallets. Pallet one, pallet two, pallet three, pallet four. I'm going to stabilize it this way and this way. So we're not flexing it anymore. We've got to create an environment where it's not trying to bend itself in a U and it's not trying to split itself in half. So I can move this around. I've got to be able to move this around without us breaking parts. So that's next. Okay, school's over. I wanted to show you this too before we move on. Because this is all going to change. I'm, this is going in the garbage probably tomorrow. This is the back of the cabinet. Um, so 100%, to add even more insult to injury, 100% of the exhaust air for this entire amplifier has to come out of these slotted holes. That's just the way they did things back in the day. I don't know. This is a, a ease of manufacturing process here. Instead of cutting a slot in here with a grinder or a nibbler like what I'm going to use or a break or a cut or any of that, they just drill a bunch of holes across the back of the, the cabinet. This causes a lot of airflow restriction issues. That and, well, the piece of heat sink was sitting a pen's width away from these holes. So most of the air that was getting pushed into the cabinet was just blowing by all the parts, not even hitting the heat sink and just squirting right out these holes. But this is amazing to me. Somebody at some point, this amplifier touched a positive lead on a battery. Look how discolored that is. Yeah, but this is literally made of tin. Like, So we have aluminum, the stainless steel hardware holding the edge brackets down. I got aluminum pop rivets holding the angle iron down, or not angle, angle aluminum, on both sides. Um, this thing's stable now. I can move it around. Like I can pick it up and I can move it around, right? I was sitting here thinking. I was doing some simple math on this deal. There's roughly 1,068 parts on this board, not counting the combiners and the splitters. Let that sink in for a minute, y'all. That means it's 1,068 parts I've got to check and certify that have all been soldered to by about 50 people. That's every piece of ferrite on the input and output transformers, capacitors. It's a lot, is the best way to put it. That's the humble way to put it. It's, this is going to be challenging. Um, just the longer I look at this, the worse it gets. Like, okay, I can figure out how to work around that. And okay, yeah, that looks kind of borked up. Either way, this is going to have a lot of solder work, you know, splooshes on the board, right? There's just no way around it. This whole mess over here It is currently 2.30 in the morning. I think it might be time for me to call this quits for the night and maybe come back to this a little bit more rested tomorrow, but man, that's a big number. It's a lot of parts. And now I see why the old guys that I've been talking to about doing this project, they're like, <laughs> good luck, dude. <laughs> um, I got to say the highlight of this day has been this here. 
I had to just about fall over laughing. Ah. This pop can of a tin. Um, this wadded up like a cheap shitty box because that's what it is. But the funniest laughable thing of the whole nine yards is this right here. A hundred percent of the output goes through this wire and out that connector. Does that look good to you? I'm just saying it. We're gonna have like 10 or 15,000 watts plus going down that single piece. That Does that really look right to anybody? I'm just asking for a friend, of course. So I was standing at the metal shop today and I was having to get more angle and some other stuff because, well, today is Friday. Um, the Friday before the Christmas, which is Monday of this year. And I've, uh, was thinking, man, how am I going to bolt this cabinet down? And I was thinking, man, I could run wires like this and that. And then it dawned on me if they have a thin enough, thick enough piece of copper that I could run this right down the middle of the damn cabinet just by removing some stuff, stuff that I'm going to change out anyhow and bolt the whole center of the amplifier down and run it through 20 and 20 that's the total amount of surface area of screws okay that's a little bit bigger than a piece of four gauge worth the total sum combined surface area you could run 20 screws right down the middle of it now you guys know that i've got this massive soldering iron collection right well then i thought i thought came to me well instead of having all these wires running everywhere why don't I build a custom copper bar that goes down the middle of this thing? I can bolt it down to the base plate for the amplifier and then solder the bar to the actual phenolic and then we can lock this whole structure down. Then I could do the same thing going here, down, down the T-section and make it so it can't, nothing, nothing can bow or flex or remove. Now that we've got this, you know, physically bolted down, better than that sheet metal that was holding the thing together, right? You guys gotta understand, I recognize this for what it is. This is a lot of bad, okay? There's just a lot of bad. The, like I got in here with a scotch Bright cloth and I cleaned up the copper underneath the bar through here so I can solder to it up here in this, this front end where it's all corroded. And there's holes in the board. Like right here and right here, there's holes in the board from where something positive is, at some point has fell down and there's a lot of bad. And I feel like I'm kind of grasping at straws to get this amplifier to go, but I, you know, maybe I should have said no. But now I got the box all tore apart, so now I'm kind of committed, right? So we're gonna make the best go of it we can. I've run a screw through here, is a proof of concept. And one right here in the middle of the, the, the two four pill panels, or the four pallet panels right here in the middle to kind of keep everything locked into place. Now I did last night do some experimentation on this end down here. I sprayed some cleaner on it and worked it around with a brush and I was able to get some of this nasty green corrosion to come off the board. These combiners have been through so much hard life. I mean, these here have just been beat up along with these combiners here have just been beat up and this whole, why couldn't we extend the RG400 and just run it through the transformer itself? What's, why do we got a heat shrink? So I'm saying into the future, I'm considering removing all of this coax and just straight up starting over. Some of this stuff's got burns in it and hacks and cuts in it and has been hit with a soldering iron so much 
was to simply remove these combine or the yeah combiners here in the middle. I could get in here to get some of this more cleaned up and have a little bit more clean solder area to work with. I mean, there's there's freaking duct tape and stuff holding some of this down, and I I'll come to that later. Today we've got to finish making this thing one homogeneous unit and giving it a good ground source. So if I take and Let's say I take a ground bolt and I put it, imagine into the future, a bolt here, and then with a copper bar, I come down here to where we've got big metal mass and put a big bolt and a big washer, and another ground and bring it down on that side. This metal is thick enough to carry that amount of current because it's not all centralized in one spot. It's spread out. The current draw is uniformal. So what we have to do is we have to provide it enough ground. So what I could do is after I get this bar in, I can go back and drop, let's say a screw through here, another, another nut and bolt through here, another nut and bolt, another nut and bolt, another nut and bolt, and so on. So that it's not having to run all the way to the edges of the cabinet to get ground. That way the transistors in the middle aren't starving. Transistors on the edges aren't starving. We're gonna polish this turd. Needless to say, when we come back, I don't know how well this is going to work, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to start out down here on the clean end where I'm going to have relatively smooth sailing and see if I can if I can get a, a solder joint to take here and then another one to take here and another one here. We'll stitch weld it or stitch solder it all the way down. With that and then the pressure of us pulling up from the bottom, pulling down from the top, and our sides being locked in, we no longer have any flex in the middle of the cabinet. It can't. So these solder joints will be a lot stronger than, well, I'm not going to lie, I had to take some straps off. This is what they considered to be a good ground that went between the two boards. So they'd have one here and another one here, another one here, and another one here. That's the only thing that was reinforcing it was like four or five little hunks of 14 gauge wire. And then they'd bury it in a shitty solder blob like this. Like this here. If you guys knew how much of this stuff I've sucked up, pulled off, peeled out of this amplifier. Anywho. Well, it's the day after Christmas, and uh, I have decided that we're going to take the entire output and input network completely out of this thing, and um, I'm going to embrace the fact that I just have to kind of start over here, back the gain down. You see how green and discolored the board is here? Well, I can't, I can't work in that environment. I got to have it cleaner than that. So we did get the ground bar in that runs the whole length of the amp and got it soldered into this incredibly dirty copper fairly well, which adds a lot of strength to it. Now, my other goal is to get these coaxes out of the way and get rid of these broken joints and make this into one homogeneous joint, put a couple screws in that. But the main reason that I need to get rid of the input and output network is it's all broken. It's, it's just all broken. And the grounds on it are really poor. Um, where things are soldered down, it's just poorly assembled. And I'd rather just take it off and start over than be chasing the problem down later. And at this watt level, it's, it's kind of silly not to just go ahead and take the time and do it right. So the corrosion issue, this and this side of the board look relatively the same. Well, this is what I'm able to get if I take some time with some rubbing alcohol, a really stiff brush, and spend about 20 or 30 minutes, I can get most of that corrosion to come off. So we have a cleaner surface space to work with, but we got a lot of solder dribble. So this afternoon's goal is to get all of this tore up, 
get the rest of this out, input output network tore up, get this piece of wire out of here, which I don't know what it does, but uh, get this all removed, try to get all this cleaned up, and then I'm going to come back with the solder sucker and I'm going to start pulling up solder. A lot of this, a lot of the work involved with this is just going to be cleanup time. But I mean, we went from that to this. It's just very messy, shits everywhere. You should see the floor in here now. It's completely covered in junk. Um, I started going along last night and doing this because I'm going to replace these resistors. I'm just give them a little tug, right? Little tug, little tug, little tug, little tug, a little bit of a tug. Oh, blink, that one fell off. A little bit of a tug, a little bit of a tug. Oh, that one fell off. A little bit of a tug. <laughs> here let's go in here close so you guys can understand what I got to overcome I have roughly speaking um, I got to pull each transistor out test it and then catalog it and then put it away for the guy because he's gonna want these parts back there's a hundred transistors in this amp it's not like we're talking oh hey BBI you changed out 12290 now go ahead and keep that other part it's okay no hundred transistors right so I've got to go pull each transistor, clean up this level of solder work, right? And then some of the solder work going from the transformers down to the transistors is just uh, scary. So then I got to clean each pill pocket out as I go. So a lot of this and I mean a lot of this, like you guys are going to be surprised. I was sitting there thinking about it last night. The only place that we need these larger toroids are here at the final combiner stage. We don't need to have this big heavy mass hanging out here. And the other problem is some of these boards that these toroids are mounted on, now that I've gotten in here and gotten to see it closely, they've actually been caught on fire. They've been burnt. So, I don't, let's just tackle it one, one thing at a time. Um, I was looking in here the other day and I saw one of these, one of the tabs wasn't even, yeah, this one here, the tab isn't even soldered down on this. It's got solder on it, but it's not physically making any connection. See that? If I put a dental pick underneath that, you can see the crack in the solder right here. It's not a shadow, that's a crack. If I put a dental pick on it, I could peel that up. Um, I've got a lot of board reconstruction I gotta do too. Like this here, there's about three or four spots here. This whole mess here. Plus then look at the quality of the solder work I've gotta come back in and repair. It's like that everywhere. I was actually thinking to myself yesterday, Boy, Luke, it might have been easier for you just to pull all the parts off the board and lay down a new piece of Fenelic and maybe start over. But we're going to try and make a go of it. We really are. But that's where we're at today. Um, I've just been having a hard time finding free time. It's been, you know, Christmas and my birthday. and But now I've got a good solid seven days I can sit down and work on this. I think we're going to make some pretty fast progress on it. But... Today the goal is to get all the input and output network, um, this portion of it anyhow, and the coaxes. This RG400 is overkill. Um, get all that out and removed, get the board cleaned up, um, start pulling our 100 ohm resistors, and maybe start pulling some transistors. Intermixed in this we've got blown transistors and good transistors and I need to quit whining and start working. Anyhow, that's where we're at today. I'll be back here later this afternoon to give you an update. Well, okay, so I wanted to show this. So this here is a repair on top of a repair on top of a repair. Please note that we have the coax, direct fed, coax, direct fed. They go through and they solder, but in here someplace we've got um, 
Teflon wire. Well, then there's a joint, one here, another one just on the other side of this tube, and then a connector here. We can see on the coax where we've had continuous burning taking place. Um, so inside the toroid, and look at this. Inside the toroid itself, I'm sure there's arcing and burning. All of this stuff is full of that, right? I feel like I'm just cutting cancer away trying to find good margins here. I mean, this is... <sighs> All right. Um... Go through and now I got to pick all the solder balls off. And hopefully we can get this to clean up a little bit. But 99% of this... Oh, God. It's the dirtiest my workbench has been in years. 99% of this has got to go right into the trash because I don't want any of those parts floating around. This is part of the ground bus lead that I had that was over here and it was... <laughs> it's just amazing. This amplifier is just amazing. Well, hi ho boys and girls. On today's episode of Mr. Rogers Amplifier Repair Business, um, we're back on this 96 pill, and I've got most of the green crusticles scraped off the end of this end of the board. Um, what I was doing earlier is I was going through, and remember how I was talking a couple segments back about how this amp would run a whole lot better if it had good unified ground, right? So I started at that end of the amplifier, you guys can't see. Um, in between each one of the rows of pills, I've gone and drilled and added screws. We'll use the nasty end of the, the, the bit here, the dirty, the stinky end of the stick. Um, so I added screws here. Now we've got this big solid ground that's here. We got a board ground that's here, and another board ground that's here, and another board ground that's here. So I don't feel like I need to throw another screw in here or another one over here. So I turn the amplifier around. And by the way, my God, look at my workbench. I've got stuff everywhere. This thing has trashed my floor. I got wire bits all over the damn place. This amplifier has been a mess. The mess is going to get worse. I was getting ready to add the extra piece of phenolic to hang off the end of the amp, to marry up to the cabinet, to partridge in a pear tree. I was going to start doing the work here, and then I was going to go work up this side of the amp. Pull all the flybacks out, pull all 48 transistors up this side out, like I've already done over here, and uh, get ready to start doing screws. <clears throat> Remember how I was talking a couple segments back about how when the air goes in that end of the cabinet, and by the time it gets down here, it's superheated, and it can't really do any physical work, so we only got a couple different things that we can do. Split our air distribution up so we got air that goes out that way, and air that goes out this way, and or more volume, right? So that's when we start talking about going to a blower. I'm sitting here looking at this last... <clears throat> row of eight transistor um, transformers. Let's go take a look. That's no good. Oh. That's held down by the dreams of small children in third world countries. That one here? Look at that. Yeah, yeah okay. Let's go to this one. This one's actually got some metal to it. The problem is the backside of the transformer has been completely blown off. It looks like at least twice and is being held down by some Teflon wire they've stripped off and they've got it soldered to the back of the transformer and then another big piece of braid underneath that trying to marry the transformer. The traces are all scrubbed off. This transformer here, this gets even better, yo. Let's look at this. This transformer here is held down by a separate piece of phenolic and double-sided stick tape. 
Look at that. That's got to get repaired. All of these traces have to be repaired because there's physically nothing holding these down other than blobs of solder. I don't really care about the, the contact surface on the board, although that does come into play. I don't really care that the amount of capacitance, believe it or not, our heat sink is ground, okay? And then if we take a piece of phenolic and stick it right above that heat sink, now we've created a capacitor. It's part of the circuit for the component. Well, the trace is all gone. So now that whole bit of capacitance is now missing. It needs to have more metal mass, physical metal mass. It has to have roughly the same amount of metal mass on each one of these points on the board. Otherwise, we're gonna create an imbalance, is what it is. This has gotta come off, that's gotta come off. That's gotta come off. This has gotta come off. And I have to create new trace material. The reason that trace material is so vitally important is because if I have a blob of solder that's attached to the front of the transformer, and that blob of solder is blobbed up enough that it maybe makes contact with the tab of the transistor, who's to say that that doesn't all break and we have a cold solder joint and we keep blowing a pill here? So somebody goes and they change the transistor and they blob more solder on top of bad solder with this all full of corrosion and dirt and filth, and we get more problems. And it continues on. So we have the compounding issue of the heat getting distributed out the end of the stack here. And we've got already superheated air and these transistors are taking the biggest beating. But now we're also gonna provide them with the worst electrical connections that we can possibly provide them. You have to think about how the electron energy is making it to the transistors. We had no ground, no ground, this wasn't grounded. Couple little rusted sheet metal screws, like these here, going through aluminum, through galvanized. This, this, this is literally half of the screws that were holding the whole amp in place. These six little screws are all rusted and gross. The electron pixies or somehow magically making it to these transistors are literally put in the worst possible environment that they could have to work. We kind of have the same problem going on over here. And I think this here, there is literally no trace up here. No trace. Physically is no trace. So where is it getting ground? Not only is it the ground that powers the transformers as a reference, but there's no physical ground here. So the only way that there's ground that's present right here is what's being passed from this ground trace right here and this ground trace right here. Well, I don't know if you've ever taken the top off the 2879C transistor. I have. I was lucky enough to be part of the team that tested and r and d these way back when, and I said I didn't like them, and it was because of one component inside the transistor. There is a bar that goes from this edge of the transistor to this edge of the transistor. It crosses over the top of all of the transistors inside this case. The bar is too thin, the die is too thin, the metal material that makes up the legs is too thin, and the die is too thin, period, that would they cut this out of. So when the transistor comes underneath a heavy current load, that bar will bend like a fuse. So I tell some of the guys that I'm, I am teaching or helping them learn, if you go and fire up a 2879C box, put it on its lid. So the first time you throw a big DC with it, at least the bar that goes across the top of the transistor will bend away from the components that are making the transistor work instead of bending down and shorting out the whole transistor and causing it to blow up. 
Now, in the later versions of the 2879C, they've changed this, and now there is a 64 gauge piece of wire that goes from here to here, across the inside of every one of these components. So 100% of this transformer and this transformer and the electrical current that provides half of the operating current for this and this all come through this little piece of die material that's on the inside of the transistor. So this has to all be repaired as well. And it goes on and on and on. How does this work? Somebody explained this to me. This is part of the metal shavings that I've been blowing all over my shop as I've been trying to drill and add ground to make it so this thing might actually possibly work. How does this work? This is our hot bus. See this? This is ground. I can get a dental pick underneath it. How is this blob of solder not shorting out, causing the whole box to burn to the ground. Mysteries of the unknown in the electrical universe. Needless to say, when I get over here, I might have to take the solder sucker to that. This, my friends, has been my most powerful tool. My big black solder Okay. So I got the gain turned way down here. That's what the gain up. This is this 8 pill section. I want to show you this because this is breathtaking to me, guys. Breathtaking to me. This is the output transformer that was sitting here. It sat like that, like so. This is the combiner board that was sitting here. You see the little hole in the combiner board? Here, lean. See the hole? This wire was stuffed inside of this hole, like so, and was being held together by don't know what. But when I unsoldered the transformer, this thing just fell off. That's probably why this, this solder tab here has been on fire a couple times. And that's probably why this transformer has been rebuilt so many times. That's what's left of this trace on this transformer. This little glob of shit. See that? Turn the gain back up. That little glob of shit. The front and the back side of these transformers are completely borked off. Look at this. That's the back side of the transformer. I got a friend on the phone with me right now, and he's like, man, you'd probably been better off. You would have pulled all the parts off and started over fresh. Yeah, probably. This is the trace, or what's left of the trace that was here. Can't tell me that hasn't been soldered to a couple dozen times. And it all come down to not having enough airflow to get enough air in that end of the cabinet, and then having not enough space to let the air out. I'm starting to think he might be right. I should have just started over. What a mess. Let me go spend the next couple hours sucking up all this gross nastiness and then I'll can cut new traces for each one of these and we'll start over, get it all cleaned up. Before I go and I fix this, I want to show this to you guys. This poor amp can't get out of its own way to save its life. So, there, that's a pretty good showcase of what we got going on. Zoom in a little bit more. Here's the problem with using sheet metal screws. Um, I gotta go through and obviously wash all the pill pockets. And yeah, all the traces have been rebuilt to where they're actually got material on them now. Here's another big thing. If you are a new up and coming amp builder and you have one transistor that keeps failing continuously, like let's say you have one come in, it's got one burn pill, you change that transistor out and then a week from now it blows another transistor. Nine times out of 10, what that is, is where material has lipped up. You see this, see these big burrs? 
over here too usually comes from screws and they'll fold the heat sink up bends it up and so it won't let the transistor sit flat on a heat sink so it gets very 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 hot every single one of these transistor holes has a burr on it every single one of them some are well more graduated than others that there that there that there that there so not only do we have the hottest air in the whole amp trying to cool this last section but none of the transistors can make contact with the heat sink well i start looking and same thing going on here and here and here and here and here here look at that Look at this, look. See that? Same thing going on there. As I go and I look up the 48 transistors this side of the box, even the front end, which isn't in that bad of shape in comparison to this end of the box, this is still very much burn up. This has got all the same problems. It's got burr after burr after burr. So now what I have to do to fix that problem is I've got to go countersink each one of these. So what, 96 times for just this one side. It won't take that long, but I got to document it, right? A lot of the problems that I have going on here are also presenting themselves here. I'm seeing them over here and seeing them over here. Now we're going over this in excruciating detail on this side because I'm not going to show this again. I'm running out of time and I got to get this thing put together. I've had family issues and some personal things going on over here that have not allowed me to focus for the last like 15 days on this deal. So I've been working on it in the evenings, but I got to, I got to kick this into high gear. So I'm going to spend the next few days just completely bored down getting this done. So what I'm doing here, I'm going to do over here as well. We are going to change these out. This, these are too big. These boards flop around too much. There's not enough. Let's just say it's super unsafe. It's not the way I'd like to play the game. So at this point, I've took this down far enough that I have to technically own it, right? I have to accept the fact that this is now going to be 100% most likely gonna, I'm gonna end up living with this amplifier until I die. I just, when this thing breaks, it's gonna come back here. If it isn't something as simple as changing a transistor. This board looks horrid. Please understand that, but I am working with what I've got. So, and I think I've said that enough. I think everybody's heard it. The other problem I've got now is I've gotta take this whole mess apart and some of these transistors are in pretty rough sh or transformers are in very 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 poor shape um half the traces are ripped off of this one and the faces of them all look like smashed asshole right okay i'm going to countersink all of these and and I got to hit this with the air compressor. Thank God I got a friend coming over tonight. He's going to help me take this thing off the bench. I got to clean the bench up, and clean the floor up before I moved over here. Otherwise, the filth is just going to keep adding to itself. Like the entire amp has got little for me going and actually adding grounding screws. That kind of thing. There's drill bit bits and there's little flicks of solder. And I mean, this is not indicative of my solder work, but the board was so dirty, this is the best that I could achieve. And I'm grateful that we got this, because I know this will actually physically work. It doesn't look the prettiest, but this will work. I cannot wait to put this whole thing together and you see the finished product, at least what I've got in my brain. So, moving on. Just thought I'd show that to you. But this poor thing, it can't get out of its way to save its own ass but I was able to repair all of these traces and cut them to match the Dremel cuts. None of these are the same size, but when this amplifier was built way before Dave made, by the way, um, this is what 
what we had to work with. We didn't have cut out notched pill strips. We weren't running one inch center on the transformers. There was a guy in a garage with a Dremel. Let's see how many we can stack together. And it's awesome. I mean, in a way, we're kind of preserving a piece of history, but okay, I got to move on. Let's go. Well, let's start here on this row. Out of the eight transistors here, four of them were blown. So it's got four brand new 10 ohmers on it. Um, as you guys can see, I've pulled most of the output combiners off. It was horrifyingly shocking to me to take these combiners off, and as I'm taking them up off, the wires are falling apart. There's quite a few of these. Like there were some of them that were put together right. Like if we look at this, we see how the wires cross and they provide a insulator for the ferrite. And you see how long the lead is? Well, they took the leads. Pardon me. Oh, oh, oh. They took the leads and folded them through and soldered them in place. That's correct. Okay. This here not so correct. There's nothing there to form an insulating barrier. And I can't tell you how many of these were flat broken. Like this here. And because we don't have this extra pass, you see how that makes an extra pass? Because we don't have that extra pass, they were set on there like so. And this was, these were broken, one of the leads would be broken off several, many of these like this. They're too big, they're too heavy, and it's completely unnecessary. Now listen, I'm all for putting big parts on shit. You guys know me. I love to put big, big, giant parts and be like, oh, that's cool. In this particular situation, it's not safe with these standoffs. It's just not. So down here, this has taken hours. Um, I have sucked so much solder off this board. I've come to call these solder cakes. These are plugs of wicked off solder that I've pulled up with my solder sucker, which I think I've just about worn it out because it's barely pulling anything out of it now. I've had to replace the gasket on the inside. Let's open this up. See how the solder on the top of the sucker here? Well, it creates this little cake. Well, eventually there gets to be so much of it that the solder sucker stops working. I have to take it all apart. The tip's been clogged about 60 dozen times. What I'm going to show you now is my shop floor. Now I want you to keep in mind that this is all solder flick and solder that has popped out of the end of my solder sucker as I punched it. Um, I vacuumed my shop yesterday. Every square inch of this floor was spotless. Yesterday. This is how much not needed solder is inside this amp, or was. And this is on one half. That is an amazing amount of solder. It's like the closer you get, the more you'll see. This is literal just solder flick and screws and all the junk I've pulled out of this box in the last day. I have solder in my shoes. I've had solder in my socks. Um, I can't let my dogs out here because the amount of shit that's on the floor and this is on the daily. When I'm done today, I'll go and I'll vac this up. This mess actually continues about another two foot that way. That's just to get to where we're at now. So because I'm in the position to where the customer doesn't want to pay to have the amp completely reboarded, I have to just reach a point where I'm like, okay, it's going to work. Is it perfect? No. Is it something I really feel comfortable with? Not so much, but it's going to work. This down here has taken hours to get right. There was a literal quarter inch high block, see, even more shit. And I have washed, alcohol rubbed, scrubbed um, to get it to be just even this clean. 
this end of the amp, what I did is I went out and I squirted vinegar all over this, let it sit for a few hours outside, then came back and washed it with rubbing alcohol. My friend Todd Freeman came to town. He helped me stand this thing up. I shot it all down with carburetor cleaner, sat here and scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed, and scrubbed. then shot that down with alcohol. I thought he was going to die. There was so much carb junk coming off of this thing. I've reached a point where it's like, okay, I know all the caps are good because I've checked all of those. I know all the connections from the transformers on the output sides and the input sides are actually physically attached. Believe it or not, that is an issue. <laughs> um, checked all the caps. The transformers are actually physically connected to the right places. And there's no places that I can find which got hard solder electrical splooshes to where they're shorting out. This was a bad one. I don't know if you remember, I, I'm not going to bother to dig out the wire, but it had a piece of like four gauge that was coming to here, but it was crickled over to the board. Disgusting. I had to solder suck forever here and here and here and here and here. This entire trace was completely missing that's here from here over to this corner on this transformer into this corner was completely missing. Um, I've done all the grounding that I did over here, drilling and so on. Um, I was able to get my bit extractor down in and I was able to get two of the five broken drill bits on this side that were in the heat sink out. Um, what I mean by that is I don't know, I can't remember if I covered this two days ago on the last segment. Yeah, I've been working on it that long. As I was drilling these out for the 440 screws, the stainless screws we're going to use to hold it down, I discovered there's about seven or eight broken drill bits in the pill pockets. Let's talk about that because it's going to come into play here in a minute. The pill pockets here, let's see here, we'll use this one as an example. You can see where they've re-drilled it and re-drilled it. That's where they've had a busted bit. That's got a broken bit in it. That's got a broken bit in it. It goes on and on. Broken bit. Okay. <laughs> Everywhere you see a secondary hole broken bit. Now, some of these, uh, there's a couple down here where that's not the case. I'll show you everybody where I'm pointing. There's a couple down here where that's not the case. See, that. really, how safe is that? you're driving down the road it's like playing with your girlfriend's bean or milf nipples um, look it's it, every time I turn around I find something something more that I need to pick off this board um, I think I said it in the previous segment I should have turned this down I really should have turned this down See here, this here. Okay, that's some heat sink compound. This this particular pill pocket here in the corner started me on a path of thinking. I could not help but notice as I was down here disconnecting this cap and this cap, and I lifted the leg on this one, and I checked them for value. And look at that solder joint. Isn't that beautiful? But then I can look at it from over here and see it's connected. It's there. It's amazing solder work inside this box. I'm sitting here looking at this pill pocket, and this is probably a refurbed or rehashed piece of heat sink. The reason I say that is because I want to countersunk all of these where the screws are actually attached. And I'll say that here and here. The reason this is countersunk is because this is an old screw hole for probably another amplifier project. You'll see that there's an old screw hole here. That's the case all the way down. There's an extra screw hole, like a quarter, sixteenth of an inch offset. The problem is, is this hole here had such a lip on it. There's that, that raised elevated lip. I had to countersink this as well. So now we're getting into the point where we're compromising the amount of heat sink underneath the foot of the transistor. 
we reach a point where this is just becoming silly. Now let's go talk about this section. Let's see here. So as I'm sitting down working on this, I can't help but take a look at this here. I, I am not too sure how I'm going to overcome this problem. This might be a complete showstopper, and I might have to just call no joy. Right down the middle of the heat sink bed, right down the middle of the transistor row. Broken screw, broken screw, broken screw, broken screw, broken screw, elevated hole, another elevated hole, another elevated hole. So I start looking around, I'm like, oh boy. Oh boy. There's one that's got three separate busted off screws in the sink. And let's say, I don't know if I'm going to be able to dig the screws out and overcome this issue on some of these pill pockets. I don't know what was on this thing for thermal compounds, another question. Because each one of these pill pockets have been douched with carb cleaner, douched with rubbing alcohol, and have been individually scrubbed out with a paintbrush. But yet there's still, it's like rubbing alcohol, or like Vaseline. Needless to say, I'm going to have to countersink this hole here. Possibly get that screw bit out, or that, that, that part of the screw out, or drill it, and then countersink. Drill it, countersink, countersink drill it and counter look, look at the lip that's on the edge of this hole this doesn't have a screw in it let's make sure i got you on the right pocket here it doesn't have a screw in it but look at this it sits up high enough that i can catch my drill bit or my my exacto knife on it that is enough to make that transistor blow up about every 25 keys because it's not able to get rid of the heat. And the same thing can be said about his partner. And that one there. It goes on down the line. This row, I don't know. Um, if I wasn't up on the time for fence, like I wasn't up against the wall on time for this deal here, and um, the customer had a larger budget, I would disassemble everything back into four into the four components that it is. This board would come out. I would take the, the 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 actual copper clad portion of this off. I would sand the entire surface, and then I would go and backfill each one of those holes with on the TIG welder, sand it down flat again, polish it till it's flat, and then go back and redrill all the holes. But we're out of time and I'm out of the customer, I'm reaching the end of the customer's budget because I'm, I, this is consuming 10 more time, amount of time, 10 more, 10, 10 times the amount of time that I thought it would, I'm so frustrated with this thing, that I thought it would. Is it gonna work? Yeah. I'm just, mm, it, it's, it's, it's like herpes. It's the gift that won't ever stop giving. Um, let's talk about this over here. So I went ahead and I stitched the board together here. This is, um, what is this, how many thickness? What's the thickness? 0 0.027 thou, thick copper sheet that I laid down here. And then soldered the joints together. And then the same thing here, there was another split in the board here, which you can see in the corner. I had to do the same thing. Once again, copper's so dirty solder joint looks like shit, but it's one homogenous, as far as the electrical circuit's concerned, it's one homogenous unit, right? Um, also, got to remember, we're dealing with RF, so we've got to make sure that as far as the RF signal is concerned, this and this are the same electrical potential. Imagine that. Otherwise, the RF is going to think, oh, okay, we've got our nice ground, ground bed, ground bed. Oh, now for me to get ground, I've got to go all the way over here before I can have back this direction. It's the same thing with bonding in your vehicle. There's a reason that we bond all the panels because we want as much surface area to be at the same electrical potential and not all spread out. Okay, um, 
now to flip this around, I've got to figure out what I'm doing here. I'm going to pull all of these combiners off because these black and white combiners are the, the problem. Let me show you what I mean. This is, this is the main problem. These ferrites have to float above the, the common connection point. So if this wire in the center makes contact with this ferrite, it will short out and blow up one of the transistors in this four pill section. There's no fans or butts about it. It will blow it up. So by them crossing the wires underneath this thing, there's no way Look, there's no way that can touch the ferrite. On all these white and black transformers, and that's what this is, watch. Short, 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 short out, short. Short, short, short. You can literally physically see it touching. Just saying. I got a bunch more desoldering work I got to do over here. I've got to figure out what we're doing on down here because this here, boys and girls, is a mess. Let's look at these transformers up close. This is some unbelievably gacked out goodness. Look at this. The back on this transformer is so hosed off that there's no more trace on the bottom of it for us to attach positive. So then they took a piece of 12 gauge or 14 gauge and wrapped it around, soldered it on the top. I mean, this is, this is some hot electrical goodness. Same thing going on up here in the front. I got to clean all this off. That's part of what was left of one of the traces that's burned off from a lack of airflow and the transistors getting too hot and them constantly having to replace pills. So. I'm going to very tentatively say that we're done here for now. I got to come back and put some 100 ohm resistors on some shit and I got to put new combiners that I've got to build yet. Um, put them in play, but I'm going to spin the amp back around, pull the combiners off. Um, we're going to finish the reassembly up here and God, I've still got all the output combiners. I got a hundred transistors I have to put in this, 200 plus more screws that I've got to put in by hand because I chased all, almost 200 plus holes. I drilled them out for the right size screw, which is a 440. Um, they're all prepped. These are all brand new openings. I've got a couple drill bits. I got to figure out what I'm going to do here. Several on this side, I was able to literally just take the punch and drop it in the hole and it went blink and knock the bit out the bottom side. Thank God. A couple of the others, I was able to get in there and grab onto them and twist them and back them out. They didn't bind. Thank God. Had another one where I just had to move the transistor. I had to move the transistor mount hole over because there's nothing else I could do. So we'll see. We'll see what this other side brings. But that's where we're at now. And this is a day and a half after the last segment to get this far. And most of it has been solder work to get this cleaned up. Damn. I gotta highlight this. This was sitting like so. Instead of just repairing the trace, they had double side stick tape they put down. And they hand cut another bullshit board and then they stuck that on top had the 10 ohmers holding it down and then this piece of wire before okay <clears throat> here's after now the reason that this is important to do this repair and the reason that what was in here was never going to work is what I've got to show if you don't know how to do this style of repair on the board and you're attempting to be a technician <clears throat> and you don't know what to do in this situation and by chance you watch this video call me and I will explain to you step by step what you've got to do here to replace the trace that is now completely scrubbed off the board it's the same thing I did with all of these 
Once again, I explained earlier in the video that there is a capacitive effect that takes place when you have a ground and an insulator. So we're going to say the heat sink is ground. Okay. Now we've got our insulator, which is our piece of phenolic. Then on top of that, we have another trace. All right. <clears throat> the proximity of that trace to the heat sink, that spacing is very important. It has to stay consistent. Otherwise, you run into having an imbalance. Well, what do you mean, BBI? I don't understand. Let me show you. This is um, my dear, literally, D-E-R-E-E -E -E, uh, capacitance meter. Okay. Right now, there is 1.9 picofarads worth of capacitance present. If my wire will, there we go. 1.8, 1.1 picofarads worth of capacitance present between this lead and that lead. Now, we're going to pretend like we're going to stack this on top of the, we're going to stack this on top just like it was sitting on top of the amp. See how that jumped up to six picofarads? Now we times that by two. That makes this one transformer, input transformer, have 12 picofarads higher capacitance upon it than all the other ones in the chain. The same could be said for that and that because they were in the same condition. So the input transformer here and these, these three all had separate capacitance values to them because their trace height, the trace height, all right, is the same between these three. Then we have an oddball over here, all right. Now let's take a minute and let's take a note. Purple, purple, purple wire. All of a sudden we've got white. That means that this one transformer has been a bane for some technician out there over the last few years. And they've changed it out so many times that they effed off the wire and then they effed off the traces. And what it boiled down to is one, not enough airflow getting through the box. And two, if you can remember back a couple segments where the transistors were not able to sit flat so this thing literally got ran to the ground because the guy that was working on the box didn't know what he was looking for. This was not a repair. This caused more problems than you guys will ever even understand. And this isn't even that accurate of a meter. It's accurate enough for what I do. But I also understand, and believe me when I tell you, I have way more sensitive meters than this, but for what I do here, this is more than adequate. Okay? Anytime you have ground and then a plate that is insulated from the ground and they run in parallel with each other, you have a capacitor. Period. End of sentence. If I would have left that piece of phenolic in here, this one section would have run differently than all the other boogered up piles of shit at the end of this box. So please believe me and hear me when I say, if you don't know how to do these trace repairs, call me and I will explain to you. There's a couple different factors that you got to look at. The thickness of the phenolic, the thickness of the material that you're using for the repair, how to go about setting the, the fiberglass back up. If the fiberglass has got a burnt hole in it, I'll tell you the type of resin that you need to inject into it to recreate an insulator because if it's got carbon score in it, you got to remove all that carbon score, then inject the resin, then you can come back and lay a new trace of copper over it as long as it's the same thickness because the thickness of the copper makes a huge difference as well. Okay, class is over. It is 4.30 in the morning. I've been working on this since 9.30 yesterday morning. I'm going to go sleep for four hours and I got to get up and continue working on this. Good night. I'll see you shortly. Doesn't even look like the same thing, does it? I thought that I would not bother giving you guys another video segment until I had the opportunity to actually get something done. So we've got the ass end of this thing all populated now. Got our dual line section. This is going to be our ground connection. This is our other ground connection. Um, this is our output tune. So be our input tune, 
One of these is going to be our remote on, the other one's going to be the foot pedal. These are our two hot connections. This thing is fully populated inside and out. I have to stop because I have managed to build myself completely out of hardware. I thought I had enough thought I had enough materials to uh, pull this off. I've run out of angle. I need another piece for up here on this side so I can sit like so and complete out this rib. I've run completely out of 632s with keeper nuts on them because of this and all of this and all of this. So short of the bottom plate and these back braces, everything is held together with hardware so it's modular. So you can take the face off, you can take the side off, you'll be able to take the lid off and do it repeatedly, over, repeatedly, over and over and over and over again. So this is what I was talking about when we first started about how we get good ground as a common connection, right? So we'll have the metal mass of the cabinet, then our connected metal mass, our other metal mass here, these bonding straps. We do that to keep the relay, the tuning surfaces, all of those at the same potential. Otherwise the RF would have to go down and then through the cabinet and back up. We want it to take the shortest path as we possibly can to our coax connectors. We're utilizing the substantial metal mass of the two pieces of angle that are holding the side of the cabinet together to give us our common case bond, which is in the middle, so the current can flow outward. Then we have our common bond that goes down the middle. So a little bit of current will come from the back side of the cabinet, but a majority of it will come from the middle of the cabinet. Down this piece of not, not four gauge, four aught. So one aught lead times four. This is the same as four one aught leads, this wire. This cabinet is huge. This amplifier is huge. Okay, I used two of these leads inside that 2500 amp power supply and they didn't even get hot. We're pushing the edge of what the, what the, the wires can carry. If I wanted to be safe, I would go into probably 300, 250 to 350 MCM wire to really guarantee it. But because we have so much metal mass, we're not relying just on this one wire. On the outside, I would strongly suggest that we use two 4 aught gauge leads to go to whatever the battery box is. Remember, we'll also have another one over here going down this side. It's not there yet. I've run out of materials. <laughs> Um, changed a bunch of other little stuff back here on the back of the cabinet. This is the back side of our bird connector. I just cringe. Now I know that guys ran them for years. Or they'd take a piece of wire and they'd stuff it in the center barrel of the um, bird 43 and then solder it in place and they'd call that good. I don't call that good. To me, I call that dangerous. The solder can break, the hard wire can break, it can all have problems. This is a porcelain insulator, and this is a nut, a jam nut, imagine that, and all you gotta do is run a wire from here to here. It can flex and move, it's not solid. This makes sense, gotta run a wire from here to here. Um, the splitter combiner network, I don't know quite how I'm gonna do that yet been thinking about that on and off all day long as I've been working on this cabinet. It has been two full days since um, I started or ended that last segment of video and uh, I've been just working on this cabinet. The edges on this have come out so good. This edge here and these edge here and this and it they're very tight. I mean it's like this is gonna be a beautiful box when I'm done. I haven't fabbed a cabinet and it's been a long time. I've never built one this big, but this is what it takes. I've had several people on my Patreon group point out to me that maybe I should have broke this up 
into four individual boards, stacked them, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but then I'd have to engineer the ability. Be Let's face it, we're gonna blow more pills. It's just the way it is. <laughs> this thing's gonna get road hard, um, bent over sideways and burn up. It's just gonna get burned up again. So I have to think on the terms that somebody's gotta put this on a table, take the top off, take the side off and be able to get in here and work. So I can't go and bury all the transistors underneath wire distribution and splitter networks. They have to be able to get to all 96 transistors inside this cabinet, right? I got a ways to go, but I'm pretty sure we'll get this done here in the next two days. At least have it up and tested to the end of this video. So it's been a lot of drilling and a lot of tapping. Like this is all tapped because this isn't going to come off. The parts that don't need to come off often are going to be tapped. So we're talking drill, tapped, then put the hardware in to hold everything in place. So this has been a labor of love. I also want to take this opportunity to talk about um, something I've decided I'm going to do going forward into the future. This is technically the end of 2023, this project. So we're looking at 2024. I want to talk about, um, I want to start giving out an award. I, when I first started building, I want to tell you where this came from. My goal was to build better than anybody else in the world. I wanted to do more detail and blah, blah, blah. You guys know my story. My, my motivated goal was that I just wanted to build kick-ass shit like this all the time, right? Well, I'm there. I've achieved that position, but nobody gave me any accolades on the way, right? I've, I've got them now. My peers talk to me and they treat me as an equal now, but nobody has ever stepped up and said, man, that was like the prettiest thing that was ever built. And I want to start doing that for other people. You understand that there's more than enough work for everybody. There's more than enough work for everybody in the whole radio community. So when I bump into these builders and their ego's so big they can't get out of their own way to take a shit, man, I got, I got problems with that, right? I don't have, I'm not burdened with that ego. To me, I'm the underdog. I'm the little guy. No, I don't even know why you guys watch me, but I appreciate that you do. I've decided that I would like to start giving out an award for the most innovative ant builder per year. It's a friendly competition. I will never win this award. I will never give myself this award. I'm not interested in winning it. I could care less. But I do feel that there are other people that are in this hobby that are innovating and trying to push forward and trying to create, right? So I want to give an award for the guy that has innovated the most in 2023. I'll give guys something to work for. My friend, um, Chris, 394 over at Audible Technologies. He's just getting started. Um, a few years ago, I did this personal challenge to myself where I built a two pill and I timed it. And it had to be, it had to meet a couple standards. Some of the things couldn't be completed. I had to assemble the whole thing up to tested standards and have it finished, ready to go out the door, vinyl stickers, the whole nine yards. How I would sell an amplifier. And I did it in like 36 minutes or something. Well, I started this challenge, that doesn't mean that I build the fastest two pill in the universe. No, what I'm trying to do is motivate other people to do the same. Chris is one of two people that has picked up this flag and decided he would try. So the record stands at just short of 39 minutes. That's a completely empty fat boy one by two cabinet and going forward. I got to get him a little plaque made up too. The, the plaque's going to literally read the king of the two pill and it's got to get handed around. It's like if some of the other builders in the community, because there's many of us, want to attempt to beat that record, so be it. I'm not saying I might not come along and try it again and see if I can get my time of 30-something minutes, 20-something, whatever it was, down even lower than that. Because it is possible. I look at my video that I did and there were mistakes that were made that I, I could have done more. Now back to the most innovative amp builder of 2023. 
I want to talk about my friend Nick. Nick is uh, 757 out of Boulder, Colorado. Nick's a little stuck in his ways about some things. He's kind of a little bit of a kaji guy, but he's super, super cool. And I just admire his craftsmanship, the way he's constantly trying to do things just a little different than everybody else. He's not interested in doing cookie-cutty building. Um, he's now working his way up to where I can see it in his future to where he's going to start working on tube amplifiers, which is great. That means we have growth. We have another, another technician that's a little bit newer, maybe a little bit stronger of a back that can pick up some of this heavy ass stuff and be able to come help us work on this equipment. So Nick, you come in at number five, my man. You're, you're rounding the house at number five. I want to talk about my, my, my next friend here um, is Frank Beard at Beard Customs Amplifiers. Frank come out of nowhere in my world. Um, he's good friends with everybody and Frank, he does not do this for a living. He doesn't care anything about the money. It is simply the quality of the craftsmanship and his never ending desire to not do the same chrome cookie cutter box. He's also a tool maker. Um, Frank has picked up the mantle and is going to try and produce Texas Star cabinets for all of us that look exactly the same as the stock ones because we can't get replacement ones. The next thing he's going to work on is doing replacement face plates for us because we can't get them. That aside, the quality and the way he's gone about making circuits smaller. I, I seen him the other day build this keying circuit preamp sideband delay bias control thing that was the most intricately put together little tiny thing. He has the time to work on that. I, I've got to go at a faster pace. I can't dent it. But game acknowledges game, right? So I look at that and I went, wow, that's, that's pretty innovative. But it's not only that. He's making punch dies and there's just a lot of really cool stuff he's come up with. Uh, his fan kit setups that he's building for people. He made the top five. He's number four. Number three is a good personal friend of mine. It's X Electro. X Electro, um, we're both in the Needle Benders Club. He's a, he's a very interesting man. Once again, does not do this for a living. He does this as a hobby. But he has really, really stepped up the builder game in the LD Moss department. Uh, X Electro showed up in my universe um, a few years ago. Um, we built an amplifier together. Um, as I was building it, I was explaining to him how everything works. We sent it to him. He, he played with it, modified it, and then the next thing I know, he's built his own. Then he went on and he really went down the rabbit hole with bias and how to control the transistor, how to tune things. And then the next thing I know, he's sending me an LD MOS amplifier to look at. Now, I wasn't able to look at the thing for about six months. I just sat here in a box. But when I did, I was incredibly impressed um, with the creating of his own boards and uh, working on the back of some other knowledge he's accumulated from other people. I'm very, very, very pleased to watch him progress forward and step up. But the innovativeness of the board design, the transistor design he's worked on producing multiple pallets now that he's combining together He's really, really making strides. Now, with a lot of effort and a lot of lift on a lot of our parts, we were able to get him up and running and now he's doing uh, 3CX 3000s and that kind of thing. I would have to, I'd have to give him the mantle of number three, honestly. My friend Sharky. Our friend Sharky, everybody's friend Sharky, otherwise known as LD Moss Jesus. LD Moss Jesus came around and showed up. He started out, I think, with the two pill, then quickly went to a Texas Star, was very frustrated with the quality and what they call the build standard of some things. Most, most of the amplifiers that are built today are not built to what you would consider to be continuous duty or what. He had the Texas Star come apart. He went and he worked through it. Then he went and he bought a LD Moss palette from, we'll just say another vendor. And uh, 
the way he got treated by this person. Um, don't want to bash anybody because that's not the way I work. Motivated Sharky to go out and become the legend that he has become. He is groundbreaking and innovative work in the LD Moss community. Um, has been second to only one other person, and the other person would be Prime, but Prime's not on this list. He well, hasn't done anything this year for the most part. Well, he's done some things, but not... I, I, I divert, I come back. Sharky um, developed his own palette, developed his own cabinet, developed his own power supplies, made very many instructional videos that have allowed other people, like X Electro and multiple others, um, to start working on developing and building their own pallets as well. Um, has done very, very, very many educational videos about how this works, why this works, how this works, how this works. He just did a whole video on SimSmith, which is a groundbreaking piece of software. If you're in the ant building business, you'd understand what I'm talking about. I give the number two spot. I, I, I've chosen my friend Mud Duck Sharky as the second most active, innovative builder of 2023. And he's getting back into it. He's been dragging along a little bit, but Sharky's coming right along. In my opinion, and the person that I am going to issue the award for 2023 is the most innovative builder in the world, is my friend Illuminati. Illuminati has brought to the table several very key innovations that I need to rec recognize him for. His recraft, rebuild skills are second to none, including myself. He brought to our community the use of the laser for laser etching, laser board cutting, um, laser relief graphics, and also he figured out how to use the laser to etch the board. If we were to send this same amplifier to Illuminati, he would strip every part off this board, take these skunky ass boards, put them in his laser, and go through and knock all the solder off of every single bit of this thing, completely etch the board down to bare, bare copper again, then he'd probably powder coat everything, put it all back together, then, well, powder coat everything, then come back and cut personal little laser cut traces for every single solder joint on the... On. His work is next to none this last year. He's out of Puerto Rico. He doesn't speak hardly any English whatsoever. But we all know who this guy is. Let me step in front of the camera for a second. He has been copied and emulated on these things more than any other. Th I'm telling you. Right now, there's like five dudes that are building these things. These are holders for your Bird 43 elements. And he's customized them, like mine says Box Builder Idaho, with my logo in them. He's sold so many of these that if you, if you don't have one of these, you are left behind. This, this, this is a 3D printed thing. He developed this, he came up with this, and now everybody and their brother has got a 3D printer is copying him and trying to make money off his idea. It's probably 10 different things I've seen him come up with just in this last year like this and more. So 2023's most innovative builder in the world, in my opinion, is Illuminati out of Puerto Rico. Let's give him a round of applause because he deserves it. It would help if you want to compete in this contest that you come and join my Facebook group, post and post often so we can see the quality or craftsmanship of your work. My group is a non-judgmental. We will not demigrate. We do not put anybody down. There is no bullshit in my group. If you are a dick, I will kick you out. And my entire motivation behind a Facebook group is it's open to everybody, and everybody must help teach each other. And we must help each other. Don't be a dick. Don't be a dick. That's the only rule. If you want to be part of this competition, come join the group. Show us examples of your work. All you got to do is come put pictures up. Maybe a short video if you want to. Throw it in there, and we're going to see it. I'll see it. Everybody's going to see it. And we'll put you into the rounds. I'm telling you, though, for 2023, I take my hat off to my friend Illuminati. 
He has done amazing work this last year, and we thank you. Well, here we are on the 332 pill project, still. It's been several days since I shot the last segment. Um, it's been a rough go last couple days. Not because of this, but because some things going on with me personally. I had to have some massive reconstructive oral surgery done. I didn't know this, but I had an abscess that was above one of my root canals that I had one like 14, 15 years ago, and it's been, it caused all kinds of problems. Needless to say, I got the surgery done, and I've also been struggling with, uh, well, apparently I broke a toe, but I broke it right in the middle of the joint. Like, I've been hobbling around now for almost a month, and it's really slowed me up on this project, but I'm on the ups, uptick swing of things. So, I don't know if you guys remember or not. If we go back to the beginning of this thing, you'll see that there was a splitter here. And then that went off to a three-stage splitter that sat in the middle. Blah, blah, blah. Well, my goal was to keep it all five to ones, like what's in here. Each one of these combiners has got a five to one. The other problem we had is the combiners are huge and they're on these little tiny wires, right? We're gonna get back to this here in a second. If we think about it and we do the math, let's say that we put 2000 watts in this box. Well, <clears throat> the size of the splitters that they had spoke to the inefficiency of the combination splitting circuit that they had in here. They had these giant toroids on the output, so we went and we built these new combiners. You guys seen that already. On the output side, well, on the input side, they had these massively overdone combiners, which I don't know the material makeup of these. But where they were mounted, we've had several fires. Like, let me bring you in here and give you an example. fire. Okay. Well, we've had one there and there's another one elsewhere. Needless to say, if we do the math, we have 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, and 16. I could have stayed with the five to ones, but I would have had to have dropped 16 transistors out of the equation to make it work. Once you think about that, every layer of combination and splitting, we have a, a dB gain loss. Now you can make that back up by adding capacitance on the other side of the combiner and get it back. But still there's a little bit of loss. So if I take and I combine these two, and I take and combine these two, and then I take and combine these two. Now I have three ports. Well, how do I get a three port combiner involved with two to one? Can't, just can't. Let's say I dropped off this 16 pill section. So two to one, two to one, then I have an oddball. So I'd have to drop out 32, right? It just, it wouldn't work. There's a reason that a lot of these 96s weren't built because the boxes, the way they were put together was fairly inefficient. So I had a choice. I could chase the five to one combination network and I struggled with this for like a day. I sat down and I thought about this for like a day and I had to, there's some pros and some cons to this entire situation, right? The con is, over here at the output network. What I came up with was let's go ahead and we'll dump out the combining of this and this, this and this, this and this, and let's just go to a six stage port. Because the only thing that's saving me is one layer of splitting and combining and this is one more layer of things to go wrong. So I came over here and I created this. This is my input splitter. 
How much of this is going to get used? Probably none of it. I'm probably going to have to bypass that. This is the con. The bigger we make this the splitter or combiner, the shorter the inductor that we need because the circuit's already so has so much induction in it that this portion of the circuit to balance it out gets shorter and shorter and shorter. On the 48 pill, the last 48 pill I built, the input was maybe this long. Well, the trade-off. I can slide this over, like the way I have this mounted, I can move this over just a little bit further. The problem is now I start covering up my transistors. Now let's just think for a minute that this thing is uh, used and abused and slapped on the butt T1 and hooker, and it's most likely gonna blow yet another two or three or 10 pills in its life, right? So I need to make it so somebody like myself can get in here, pull the flybacks out, pull the transistor out, place a 10 ohm. We have to allow access to all the transistors. So what I could have done in the very beginning with this entire process is I could have made this about six inches longer slid the whole lamp board forward another six inches and then had my combiner stages sitting back here in the corner in the back which is what i should have done so we're trading off we're trading off um, the fact that we have to have it elevated which in its own way brings problems you have to bring this board to the same electrical potential as this board for this to really work properly and and um, we have a co uh, coax storage issue, which we were able to address here. The way we did this is we brought the input section over here together, this input section together, this input section together, this input section together, this one together, and this one together. So at 2,000 watts going in, we split that six ways. It works out to be roughly about 300 watts. Well, 316 can easily carry that at 300 watts, especially over this distance, which works out to be about three and a half, four feet. Easily. <laughs> um, we decide that we're gonna do something stupid and we're gonna put like a 10 pill or something into it or a 16 pill into it. That's a different story. That's 660 watts per leg. We're very much on the edge. Now, we know that the 316 can handle a thousand watts because we use it as output combiner coax in some bigger boxes, 16, 24, 32, 48. The 316 can handle that. But in those amps, the run of coax is only about maybe two foot long. So we're, we're trading off the ability of organization size and flexibility for overall reliability. Now, I'm going to tell the owner of this box that we want to keep the drive around 2,000 watts, 3,000 watts. That way we can keep it a prayer of the box not overheating. There is still an overheating issue even though we've done all this other modification. On the output side, we're going to use RG400. Now, the reason for that is, well, 8 pill, 8 pill, 16 pills. We're going to ask this combiner to hold, roughly, about 2,000-ish bird, 4,000-ish peak. That combiner will easily do the job. And we're going a total of three and a half, four feet with it. The coax is gonna heat, but it's not gonna heat enough to where it's gonna fail. It's not gonna heat enough to where it's gonna cause a significant loss in power. I played with the idea of using RG400, or uh, RG393. The problem is it's so stiff. So then I'd have to have six lines of this stuff the size of my pinky and somehow I'd have to bring it up to this combiner. This combiner is huge. Let me grab a, a ferrite bead. It doesn't look big compared to this one because of the huge ferrite cores I used in it, but let's give you a comparison. This is a half by half inch core next to this big bastard. the size of the wire that's in this. This is Teflon, by the way. Uh, 
This is type 61. Here. Once again, we have the issue of the proximity to the relay that we're going to have to overcome. Thinking about setting it like right here, like right here, because the wire that's going to connect the inductor lead from here to here is going to be very short. You set on the last 48 pill and 64 pill, they're usually about that long. Literally, four or five inches. So I want to have enough room to be add or subtract inductor if I need to, but yeah. Um, we added the pedestals here. This is going to be for our power distribution. So the way I did the ground, which we went over in unbelievable detail, is we're utilizing the cabinet body the heat sink and the back plate. So I'm going to have two pieces of four or uh, yeah, four out wire. They're going to come into each one of these pedestals. And from there, I'm going to take the positive wire and run it off very neatly. You guys know me. Um, each eight pill section is going to get its own uh, two strands worth of eight gauge wire. Each eight pill section, it'll get a positive lead and a positive lead. And we're doing that so only the 8 gauge has to carry enough current to run these four transistors and these four transistors. Where before, we had the issue of current loss. On a lot of these stages, I removed it, but they had a piece of 12 gauge wire that went here in between these two sections. So that means these two sections drink the most current, and by the time we get out here, we're starving. Right? Well, we're going to overcome that by doing a power wire here and one here. So the current evenly gets split. Now we're going to do the length of wire to these pedestals is going to be the exact same. So from the pedestal to here, back here in the back corner of the amp, or let's say here because it's in frame, and the length of wire from here to here is going to be the same length. So it's going to take some creative routing, but I think I think I'm pretty sure I've got that covered. We are on the home stretch of this. But I know, I know, and I have a feeling. I, I reached a point where I was like, okay, look. I can spend 16 more months checking every single part, or I can go on and go put it together, fire it up with low drive, and see which sections work and don't work, and then chase down the little bugs that are keeping things from working after we get 99% of the hard work done. So I had to abandon the idea of let's check every freaking part because I got 99% of the parts checked. But then as I'm going through and let's say soldering down all the transistors, I'm looking at stuff where I'm like, ah, it's a little sketchy. Let's go ahead and let's repair this. But I know something more is going to show up in testing. So I got to take some time on this. I did not picture in my brain this is my shortcoming. I did not picture in my brain how much time this was going to take. Of course, I didn't realize I was going to have all these health issues either. Broken foot, constructive surgery. I took all day. I'm going to have a whole detailed video on what they did to fix my head and what I've got to go through um, with this process, what's going on with me. I'll have that on the Patreon thing telling you the patreon guys get exclusive behind the scene content that nobody else gets just saying well it didn't it, it didn't click in my head that this is 332 pills even though i can do the math it's 64 plus 32 more transistors right 96 the amount of time i spent building a 32 pill times three this is my own shortcoming. This is my fault. But I got to stick with this till it's done. Because when this is done, this is going to be freaking dope. Kick ass. So, it is time has come. Let's put the combiner in the back. Let's get the inductor in. Let's get all the RG400 installed. And let's get the 12 volt wire installed. Well. Got the output combiner installed. Now, if somebody is to work on this after me, all you need to know 
is if you need to get to the transistors directly underneath this plate is you unsolder this coil from the relay and then there's a plate back here that you unsolder and this whole thing can rotate up of course that'll be rotating against these metal rods that are holding the RG400 in place aluminum or copper be able to rotate this thing up and then you can work on all the transistors these over here are open through here no problem um, it's just those inside two I had to sacrifice that for the proximity to the relay I'm not gonna lie I'm not too sure if this style of combining is gonna work mixed with this style of combining either way I knew going in this was gonna be somewhat of a bastard box if you noticed in the previous version there was three different styles of combiners in this amp and now we've got it down to two the question is am I gonna be able to drive this low enough to make the RF want to go this way or pardon me come this way to the combiner without having to add capacitance at each one of these stages spoke to many different people prime being one of them foxy being one of them and a couple others that used to build in this style and they assure me that the only place that they ever added capacitance was at the input splitter and at the output combiner I don't know is it gonna work I don't know I've never built one like this before so we're gonna give it a try if not we'll try something else but for right now this is what we're going with this is I feel the least of the the two devils so we'll see if we can get this to run now we get to do my most favorite part we're going to do the power wire i'm really excited about that i got the holes drilled in the red fiberglass i got the bronze bolts we're going to make this happen this is where i'm going to cut this video off it's already two hours long i've probably got another hour and a half worth of stuff including testing it that i gotta go so this is the end of part two please Follow along, let's take a look at part three. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to build a 96 pill amplifier because I guarantee you I'm never doing another one of these. If somebody wants something like this, we're gonna not do it this way. Not do it any of this way, especially this board design. We'd rotate the board, we'd have all the inputs face in the same direction, the outputs face in all the same direction, there would be a massive change. But uh, I had to work with what I got. So, on that note, I want to thank my Patreons, and I want to remind you guys that the last two hours plus of video have been brought to you ad-free because of the support of the Patreons. Please come join us. If you think you are a Patreon and you're not getting a daily update, you might want to check your account. Patreon has this thing that when they bill out at the end of the month, I lose quite a few guys and then they got to find their way back. It's an annoying process, but that's what we've got to work with. <sighs> Big shout out to Bird, Coaxial Dynamics, every single one of you guys for your patience. Let's get on with putting the power wire in this and let's hook it up to the giant, kajabillion amp power supply and let's give this a whirl. In the next video, I'll see you gentlemen. Click, click.